Fall of 2017, I had the honor of hosting a workshop at ISQUALS, the International Society for Quality of Life Studies. There, John Halliwell gave a talk, and I took what I would call a gorilla video, because I thought what he had to say was important to the happiness movement in terms of what we do in our communities, in terms of the message to our governments, and in our own personal lives. He spoke about trust and the actions that we can take in our communities to increase the happiness of each other, of our lives, and of our countries. I always, not always, but mostly start my talks with a survey. Are you prepared to help me with the survey? Are you happy? If you're happy and you don't know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then you may see what we show. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. The survey question is, are you happier now than you were two minutes ago? <laughs> the title of my talk is, How Can Well-Being Research Be Used to Create a Better Society? And the answer is, the single most important answer is, by creating a, an encompassing social identity. The Stanford Prison Experiments and the Milgram Experiments showing how you can prime people uh, to create very powerful us then distinctions that lead them to do some incredibly uh, difficult things uh, to other people. And so that led a lot of people to think that effectively that's the way we naturally are. We are us then people and we will create and exploit the divisions. Uh, but in my view, that's only because people have not done the experiments about how easy it is, comparatively, to create embracing cooperative identity. Uh, so I'm going to give you an example now. Here's the first one. And here's the behavioral experiment, which uh, lots of people prefer. Uh, these are uh, students who are asked to build Lego cars from the same set of instructions. The people on the right were building a car using the instructions written by somebody who thought like them. And the one on the left was built by the people who received the instruction that they thought was written by someone not like them. But it was the same instructions. So that's trust. They had just the fact that they thought the instructions were written by somebody like them, they trusted the instructions, so they read them, so they built a better car. If you were buying one of these cars, it's pretty clear which one they like. This experiment shows you how important social identity is. But they have to be constructed. And they obviously can be reconstructed uh, to some material effect quite quickly. If you're going to have people making decisions that are in the interests of people all over the world and in subsequent generations, that social identity has to be an encompassing social identity. If people are making decisions with a very narrow identity, then you're in trouble. Well, here is an example, and all those other social psychological experiments were all about how easy it is to create social identities that are divided, the us-them distinctions. So the lovely piece about this study, I haven't told you about it yet, was we managed to convince them to say, well, why don't you also try and construct a superordinate identity? That's one way of another term for the encompassing identity. So they did. They said, you're all uh, university students here. And uh, they found when they did that, uh, they all built the same car. So it is possible to create superordinate identities with power. There was also, uh, by Lullabond, uh, an Australian psychologist wrote a paper that never became famous because social psychology has not yet taken seriously of the importance of creating and studying and encompassing uh, social identities, where he ran a prison experiment that was very like the Milgram experiment, except he had an option, or one of the options that were possible was a collaborative outcome between, a cooperative outcome between the prisoners and the guards, and in fact that was ended up being a dominating one and, and, and produced much more, but nobody had thought of doing that before. A lot of the evidence 
that we have been turning up here uh, is of a sort to show you that what is implied by the behavior under an encompassing identity is innately human. See, people who believe that it's easy to create us then are the same people who find it easy to believe that motivations are selfish and narrow. But that turns out not to be true. There's a whole range of experiments. So we've done these things around the world where you give people something and say, spend it on yourself or alternatively give it away and they're happier giving it away than they are spending it on themselves. It's true of babies as young as 18 months when these experiments are done. It's a little trickier to find if you have a lot of ways of figuring out facial expressions with binding, etc., to figure out are they really happier doing that. And it is pretty obvious when you see the, uh, the video clips they are. Uh, now, it's probably true that we run education systems and maybe even do our parenting schools to breed that open trust out of people. What I'm going to show you here is the importance of having a shared identity in some sense or another. And it's a lovely question in the Gallup Daily Poll. Do you regard your immediate superior as a partner or a boss? Now, as you know, in the United States, and in fact in most Western countries, not every country in the world, but in most countries, there's a U-shape and age, which starts high, goes down to a mid-life, low, about 50 and up. Some people, found, because it's been found so universally over the last 30 years, some people say this is an innate mammalian response, and they found it in orangutans and said, therefore, it has nothing to do with uh, humanity is in, 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 in particular. I was skeptical of that notion. Um, so I said, well, you know, uh, sort of accidentally, we found that uh, this U-shape was smaller uh, for people who did not feel work-life pressures, work-life balance pressures. I said, hmm, maybe there's more to it than we thought. Maybe it's true that the kind of social environment in which you work is such a key determinant of your well-being that, and there's enough changes for most people over the life course, that it, the actual social context gets worse on average in middle age uh, by enough to create this significant u shape So if, if, we, if we could prove that, it would make a powerful addition uh, to the case that, in fact, the social aspects, so and these are remediable social aspects of, of life, are, in fact, the primary determinants of uh, how happy people are. Uh, well, here's the u shape and age for U.S. workers. You see it's uh, highly significant, those little uh, black things there are the 95% confidence region, so it's, it's, uh, these are very big samples. So now what happens if we look for what's true of people who uh, view their immediate superior as a partner rather than a boss? So that's the light blue. You see there's essentially no significant bump from the young uh, to the middle age. The U shape is essentially, come on, that, that mid-life. Low. If you look at the ones where they view them as a boss, not only are they less happy everywhere, but the U shape is much deeper, which says you never want to work for somebody whom you regard as a boss rather than a partner. Did you ever dream that that difference was as important as that? Are you familiar with the wallet question? The Gallup World Poll had it one year, uh, but it's been used in a number of other surveys. We have very big samples in the Canadian Social Survey. Uh, and it's a, the beauty of it is it was developed in response to skeptics who said that general social trust question, do you think people can be trusted or you have, can't be too careful in dealing with people, yes or no, was too vague. You didn't know what people were thinking about when they answered the question. So they said, why can't we have a very specific question? So we designed a very specific question. We said, if you dropped your wallet with $200 in it, how likely do you think it would be to be returned if it was found by A, a neighbor, B, a co-worker, C, a police officer, or D, a stranger. It's the only trust measure I can think of where you can ask about people's trust and you can also measure trustworthiness on exactly the same frame. So we can tell using these data whether people are blindly optimistic, as people sometimes accuse me of being, or whether they're blindly pessimistic 
in that they do not believe the happy truth about their neighbors. So here it is. So uh, the survey is 24%, plus or minus a third of a percent. These are very big samples. And the actual wallet return was 16 out of 20 wallets, 80%. And 20 is not a big number, so there's quite a big standard error of that. And uh, I include this slide in every talk I give because it's, it's the most important, least understood fact about humanity that there is. And so every time I talk to a national statistical agency, I said, you ask the wallet question. And then I talk to the researchers and I say, you, you drop wallets. Because we really like to know everywhere if this is a phenomenon just about Toronto or whether in fact the same, at least directionally, the same thing is true around the world. Now, why is that so important? Well, it turns out that in those surveys where we have measures of trust of various directionality, they all tend to be very important. Trust in police, trust in neighbors, trust in your colleagues at work. But we know that what makes you happy is what you're expecting your wallet to be returned. It's true of anything, right? You, 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 how fearful are you of crime? It's what you think about it that determines whether you're unhappy or not. It's, what, whether, it's not what's actually going to happen. Well, just as it's true for crime that people systematically overstate its probability and, and then are more fearful than they ought to be, uh, for this trust measure, it's clearly true in pain. So they're surrounded by benevolent, trustworthy people, and of course, I put this under generosity because this, uh, this is quite deliberately a benevolent act, right? You can be perfectly trustworthy in the sense of always keeping your word, never doing anything other than what you said you would, but you can still be very busy and walk by the wall and not pick it up and return it. These are all people, eight, eight out of eight, eight out of ten picked up the wall and disrupted their daily life enough to try and find and succeed in finding uh, the owner. Well, that's very powerful. Because the actual wallet return is a measure of how connected the community is, how benevolent your community is. Now it turns out, whether we run the experiments on conditioning in labs or wherever we run them, when people are in an environment where they feel at home, where they feel trusted, and when they feel trusting of others, they reach out to others. And we know it's this personal reaching out to others that create collaborative, cooperative behavior that makes life worth living. So people not only enjoy working collaboratively, but of course collaborative action actually gets things done that uh, people want. I show this every, every time I'm talking to an audience with a lot of media presence. I say, this is your fault. Because the actual wall of return is what it is, but nobody knows what it is. And the newspapers, if it bleeds, it breeds, the newspapers and all the media uh, typically look for awful things and report them. They look for things that show somebody's ill motivation, so people end up thinking they're living in a world where that is predominant, or at least majorly, major represented uh, behavior. And of course, that's not right. <laughs> for a lot of the work that many of us do, when you ask what can be done to improve things, we realize quite quickly it's nothing to do with specific national policy instruments that's going to change the life. It's going to depend on changing the way in which real life institutions are conceived, operated, and run. And to know what really counts and where, you really then need to drill down into each nation and find out what well-being looks like in geographic disaggregation. And to do that, of course, you need pretty big surveys in countries, and that's the next stage. If you think in order to make things happen, you have to measure, then you have to do the research, and then you have to try different ways of improving those aspects of life. Uh, at the level of the community, we still aren't at the measurement level in most countries. Uh, we've been doing some experimentation with Canadian data, trying to take what are quite large samples from the uh, community health surveys, and uh, divide them optimally in regions so that uh, we divided the whole country into 1,200 bits, each of which has the same population. And of course, that has the magic that means the, the sample size is, is, is essentially the same in each one of these regions. And so you're, uh, you can 
deal with these data and uh, actually look for significant differences, which you want to see. So here's the map for Canada. So uh, the way that you're, you're up at uh, above 8.4 for the darkest green and below uh, seven and a half for the uh, darkest red. And you can see there's a bit of a east-west tilt there, but it's uh, uh, systematically a bit lower as you get out where I live. But what really is going to be striking, in the, I've just put rectangular boxes around uh, Canada's far, four largest, uh, not four largest cities, representative cities, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, the three largest, and St. John's Newfoundland, which is there for a special reason. Um, because it is a city, but it's a city uh, with a difference. The first thing that you can't see so well from this map, but you can see from this, if you can shift those things around, you see each one of those uh, uh, curves, that it joins all the communities in that city, or in the case of the rural communities, all the rest of uh, the communities. Uh, and so it isn't just a point for happiness in Vancouver. There are many communities in Vancouver. There are many communities in Montreal. There are many communities in Toronto. And you can see what a big spread there is among communities in their average life satisfaction. So obviously, you then want to dig deeper uh, and find out what explains which communities within these metropolitan areas are happy and which are not. But equally noteworthy, you'll notice that Montreal is the happiest big city by a margin. And that is a measure, not a measure, it's a consequence of what we call a quiet happiness revolution in Quebec. Uh, 30 years ago, we've had enough of these data with linkages to be able to trace the inter-regional differences in life satisfaction for the past 35 years. Uh, Quebec was way below the national average 35 years ago. It's come steadily up. Uh, through the whole period, and now, as you can see, uh, has passed through uh, the national average. And attempts to explain that with, by standard uh, economic variables fail completely. And uh, the answer lies in a feeling of being at home, which is not possible uh, in Quebec in a way that it wasn't before. And knowing this quiet happy, happiness revolution, when I was asked to forecast the results of the last election and whether the Parti Québécois would be likely to win or not. The evidence of what isn't there it has gone. It used to be a divided society in a way that was, uh, was painful for all. It is simply not divided that way anymore. Now, the other notable thing is the non-tracted areas. So these are the ones that are in those big blocks of, of uh, anything outside the metropolitan area. As you can see on average, they're significantly happier. And now we come to look at the actual three big cities and, uh, and St. John's. Uh, you can see in all the big cities, you see less red in Montreal than in Toronto and Vancouver. I've already explained that. Uh, you see no red in St. John's and Newfoundland. And then we explain it with the kind of model that we use for the World Happiness Report. We find the key drivers are, of course, income favors the other provinces, right? The policymakers are busy trying to take people out of Newfoundland and get them somewhere else where the, the jobs are. And uh, these days you're saying, in fact, the people in Newfoundland are happier than the people out in Fort McMurray. Why? What's, what's going on when we measure in those happy communities? And it's time spent with family and friends. And it's uh, trust measures, too. They're all higher. Corresponding, right? Because if you have more rapid and continuous uh, deep human connections with people, uh, then that makes you happy. So we have to make the big cities have the social fluidity and warmth and connection that happens more naturally in the rural areas. We know it's important. And uh, the question is, how easy will it be in order to make it happen? Uh, in, in a way, we have to start thinking of either creating green and common spaces in, in the spaces between the buildings and in the corners of the big cities, or reshape our own minds. So the elevator, which people use as an excuse for looking at the elevator regulations on the wall, 
or nowadays, of course, embedding themselves in their, in their cell phone. Uh, and it should be a social event waiting to happen. This is the, the, the elevator. It's the back of the vertical sidewalk. And so you deserve the chance to connect with people. 